sorry about that. Okay, it is uh, should be recording sound and it should. Uh, somebody wrote it's going great, but anyway, um, we're starting over, and uh, I think mm -hmm. you can begin. Okay. Um, I'm Lila Wickham and I'm on the board of the Cannon Beach Arts Association and as all of you know okay. you've been coming oh, to, the, I'm on the board of the Cannon to the gallery for 25 years. Um, Bob I'm getting a lot of feedback. It's fixed. Okay thanks and um, it's one of my favorite events and I um, I don't know if you all remember when we had at the gallery we had um, Hank Pander, and he had done this huge um, uh, painting of a naked woman with tattoos. And as the poets were speaking, they were all like kind of looking behind them going, oh my, this is, um, I feel like someone's looking over my shoulder. Anyway, it was very funny. And um, so when the pandemic went on for so much time, um, we get money from the uh, community uh, tourism funding. And I thought, wouldn't it be fun to do a couple of books, like community books? And um, so we got funding from the, from the TAC to do an animal portrait book that I did. And then we, the proceeds went to the disaster, disaster animal response team that Bob Cole uh, heads up. And then the other book, I wanted to go to the Fisher Poets and for it to be an illustrated poetry book. So I approached John and like I said before, he was a little reticent about it because he knows, he knew far more than I did how much work it was going to be, but it's been a great project. And um, as I mentioned, John has been amazing to work with because he he bases his work and his principles and his values. And our principles and values were that we wanted to be transparent. We wanted to be inclusive. Um, we wanted the art to speak for itself rather than be a piece of art that tried to um, graphic, make a graphic rendition of the poet, poem. And um, we wanted to have one poem and one piece of art from each person who submitted. And John asked me if I would, um, I would choose the submissions. And so I, I did, and it was a really fun process. Got to read lots of poetry and other um, art that isn't in this particular book. So with that, um, that's sort of the background. I way underestimated how much it would cost to do the printing. So you Fisher Poets um, participated in the printing uh, expense. I think you probably know that already. Anyway, so um, I'm just gonna give you a look around the gallery. We are doing, um, let's see, to turn around here. This is our Working Shores exhibit. And I'll give you the big view first. So you can see there's lots of art in here. And many from um, Fisher Poet submissions. Try to give you a look at each one of them. That one's really high on the wall so I can't get to it very well. Uh, these are Drea Frost, these three. And she's also in the book. This, there's three of these, a green one or a red one and a blue one. And I don't quite get what they have to do with the ocean. They kind of like look like Valala Valala's to me. Um, and this is Rosie Bergeron. Uh, this is salt, whoops, get back a little bit. This is salt and steel. 
uh, by Lisa Sophia Robinson. This is one by Catherine Ann Myers. This one is called um, Buoy and Sea Lion by Rosie Bergeron. This is a John Kirk uh, photography, Night Watch on the River Walk. Oops, can't see very well there. And this one has already sold. This is another John Kirk. There's even some on the floor because we ran out of wall space. This is a big, a really big piece um, by Peggy McDaniel. Another um, large piece by Blaine, um, Blaine Verley. And two, well, I'll show them separately, uh, Tom Grog and Tom Grog again. Uh, this is Chelsea Stevens and hers is in the book also. Here's a blue shrimp. Uh, this is Ra Rachel Speakman's. And another Rachel Speakman. Three littler compositions. These two are by Casey Shannon. Um, these are in the these are in the book. Um, this one is called Caleb Haley. Oops, it's by Neil Funt. I hope I said, pronounced that right. And this one's um, derelict. It's also in the book, also by Neil. And here's another one by Neil. I don't know why it's moving. I'll try this. I'll just get back. Looks like the wind is blowing those windows. This one's called Milady. Cougar Bend. Ronnie Pulliam. Another Ronnie Pulliam. And this one, um, I know you had a, a special event for John Campbell last night. And this is a submission by Jamie Boyd. that's it, also in the book um, to commemorate his life. This is a William Wilkes. This is actually one that Linda Cook and um, Bob Kroll did in the middle of the night. Here's some bright blue ones. And these two, are uh, Peggy McNeil. So that's it for the gallery show. I don't think, oh, I missed this lily pad one. So that's it for the gallery show. Now, um, if we wanna talk about the book, that would be great.
So here, whoops, run it. Here's the book. We have um, 60 copies at the moment. And um, we're getting, well, we're getting 150 altogether. And um, we want to send all of the submitting artists and poets um, a copy of the book themselves. Um, it's $33. It costs $30 to print and $3 to mail. So um, we're on a tight margin. But um, as I mentioned, the Kenna Beach Arts Association plans to give all of the sale proceeds from that we sell at the gallery back to the Fisher Poets, so there'll be able to be additional printings in the future. So I think we're ready for the little iMovie. So Bob, there's supposed to be audio and there isn't. Clean car hearts, some still smelling of diesel fuel, most shod in Romeo slippers or boots. They're there to celebrate the local finale of the Fisher Poets Gathering, an annual creative celebration of commercial fishing in its community in Astoria, Oregon, which the Cannon Beach Arts Association has supported from the beginning 25 years ago. The, this collection of Fisher poetry you have in hand, or will soon have in hand, is the second that the Cannon Beach Arts Association has published and represents a sampling of favorite poetry, new and old, that paints a picture of the working lives of folks of the commercial fishing community. We've got pictures that tell poems too. This is our first anthology of Fisher poetry to include a sampling of visual art from the Fisher Poets Gathering. As we weather the current pandemic, the Fisher Poets Gathering anchored in the sheltered lee of second virtual online event, we're grateful to the Cannon Beach Arts Association for a chance to gather together there in these pages. The book can be purchased at the Cannon Beach Arts Association at um, at the bookstores in uh, Astoria, Seaside, and Cannon Beach. Um, we hope you will enjoy this um, beautiful Fisher poet, Jan's My Life book. Apologize for uh, missing the early audio. However, people can watch the video on our website as well. That we'll have all of the audio. Okay, my part's over. So it's to you, John. Well, thank you, Lila. Fun to be in the gallery again. I've wandered through there already, and uh, things have been hung up further since. So it's uh, it's uh, it looks great. Thanks for inviting us in visually, and then tonight uh, as well as you always do uh, for a local finale for the Fisher Poets Gathering. 
it was 25 years ago, not quite 25, 20 years ago perhaps, when we put out the first anthology, which came uh, financed by a grant from the Canopy Charts Association. So that uh, ever since we've been coming over there and uh, enjoying ourselves in your company uh, at the end. So usually it's a bunch of stragglers who are still hanging around. That story this time I rounded them up from uh, all over. Uh, folks, mostly those who were able to get something in the book here. Uh, and a few others. We got uh, Mark Casey clear up from Nome, and I see Megan's checked in. She's up there in Homer. Uh, we got folks from uh, closer than that too. So thanks for uh, thanks for having us. If everything looks like it's checking out okay, then I, my buddy Jay and me will give you a little tune here. We uh, <laughs> we might be a little rusty. We haven't played we haven't played together in a very long time. We're looking forward to doing more of it as things seem to ease up a little bit. Um, on my screen, it looks like Lila is still the one who's uh, talking there, uh, but I'm just going to carry on. You can stop me if it doesn't work. This is a song, uh, I'm a, a, I, my family and I fish sockeye salmon in Bristol Bay, and, uh, uh, and when the sockeye, we don't have them around here, they're beautiful, uh, seven, six, sometimes five pound fish. Uh, they're big, beautiful, strong fish, and we catch an awful lot of them if we're lucky in the summertime. But at the end of a sockeye run in Bristol Bay, there's sometimes a humpy run. And humpies are cute little fish. Uh, they're salmon. Uh, we don't have those around here either. But they're quite small. Uh, three, uh, four pound humpies, a big humpy. A lot of them are two pounds. Meat's a little finer. They only live two years. They're not long-lived fish. They, they go out to sea and come back. And if we stick around, we, uh, we can catch some humpies afterwards, but they don't pay us for humpies like they pay us for sockeyes. So uh, it's kind of, a, it's kind of a, a different little season. This is a song about humpy season. It goes like this. Sockeye season's over, most of the boats have gone home. Highliners have packed up, gonna leave us alone. So we skip across the water, for a pound through the bone. Cause we're staying late to fish humpies. Humpies, humpies. They got tiny scales, we got spotted tails, they don't like to swim too deep. Humpies, humpies, you can catch a lot of humpies, but you got to sell them cheap. They school up in the shallows. They run against the shore. They sometimes leap into the air, but we don't know what for. We fill the boat with humpies, then go and get some more. We're staying late to fish humpies. Humpies, humpies. They got tiny scales, they got spotted tails, they don't like to swim too deep. Humpies, humpies, you can catch a lot of humpies, but you got to sell them cheap. They were pulling humpies in, all day we shake them out. We toss them in the humpy bin, we pick up, we set out. We tie up to the tender, we hear the skipper shout. You guys sure have lots of humpies. Humpies, humpies. They got tiny scales, they got spotted tails, they don't like to swim too deep. Humpies, humpies, you can catch 
a lot of humpies, but you got to sell them cheap. We brine some humpy now and then they smoke up real nice. We even tried to eat it raw with sushi once or twice. Cause we eat lots of humpy and lots and lots of rice when we're staying late to fish humpies. Humpies, humpies. You need a lot of humpies just to fill a single tote. Humpies, humpies. Gonna have to lick some humpies if you're gonna fill your boat. Humpies, humpies. They got tiny tails, spiny tails. They don't like to swim too deep. Humpies, humpies. You can catch a lot of humpies, but you got to sell them cheap. Maybe you were singing along. We got some other songs coming later, so you don't have to have that melody in your mind for the rest of the evening. So I let Jay go for now, and maybe, uh, well, I know Holly, uh, you might like to go next. Uh, I know you have some other things you have to move on to. So uh, Holly, be on deck after Jay here, and uh, thanks for your attention, Jay. Well, I'm going to read the thing, a uh, piece that was in the uh, in the book it's called rescue tug extraordinaire and uh this is about walking up on pier three the first time i ever laid eyes on the salvage chief and uh i wrote it as a song but i'm gonna i'm gonna read it as a poem first time i saw her man i swallowed my snooze she was waiting just to be turned loose looking dangerous tied up to the dock this ain't no ordinary yacht to my eye, a thing of beauty, everything about her was extra heavy duty. Salvage chief, I do declare, rescue tug, extraordinaire. Launched in 49, sailing for the Navy, wartime workhorse, LSM 380. Saved from the torch in 49, visionary enterprise of Fred Devine. A seagoing universal rescue tool, pulls like an ox, kicks like a mule. Salvage chief, beyond compare, rescue tug. Extraordinaire. To stranded sailors, she was a hero from Kiska Island to Puerto Madero. 60 years of service, that ain't no joke. Saved more ships than any vessel afloat. Half Wolverine, half alligator. In the world of heavy salvage, she's a mean operator, salvage chief. Beyond compare, rescue tug. Extraordinaire. You could slip a disc just gazing at her tackle. Tommy Moore's skookum blocks, ball busting shackles. Three salvage anchors lying in the breach, locked and loaded, six tons each. Laying in the surf, wrenching on a wreck, breakers over the bows, sweeping down her deck. No cure, no pay, lest we forget. In a high risk game of salvage roulette. Flipping through the log books would make you weep. Vessels in distress or stranded on the beach. Ghost ship Eurypolis. Drill Rig, George Ferris, Prince Dam, Mr. Chips, Don Jose Figueres, York Mar, Sensenina, Chip Barge Bandon, Pine Bluff Victory in the Keystone Canyon. Many a doom plagued the vessel, many a sinking ship owed their resurrection to the chief's tenacious grip. Racking up the victories, a reputation grew at the hands of Captain Reno and a hardy, loyal crew. Liberty ship Lipari, FV, Arctic wind, motor vessel Vasa, and the Li Wang Zin. Cap Dianus Chickasaw, FV, Golden Fleece, Ocean Beauty, New Carissa, Exxon Valdez. So many prizes, so much precious tonnage. A household word at Lloyd's of London. Over the years, she spawned a legion of chieftains, welders, divers, Ordinary seaman, Reno Mattia, and Fred Devine kept her in the black, chrome plated diving helmets riding on her stack. She could tease the moon out of a wishing well or rip the doors right off the hinges of hell. She ain't no rusting relic, she's one of a kind. Became a legend in her own time. Salvage chief, well beyond compare, rescue tug, extraordinaire. Thank you. That's my pal Jay. 
Yeah. Good, Jay. Thanks for bringing Salvage Chief back to us. Well, I think Holly might be up next. And then uh, Rich Bard, if you get on deck for us, that'd be terrific. Great. Thank you, John. Thank you, Jay. That was amazing to hear the history of the salvage chief. Wow. I want to learn more about it. So um, I'm going to read not my contribution, but some poems by Sue Sutherland Hansen. Before I do that, though, I just want to thank the Cannon Beach Arts Association. It was wonderful to see the Working Shore exhibit even virtually. And I, I remember reading at your beautiful gallery space and what a lovely space it is. So it's nice to imagine us being back there again someday. And also thank you to Lila and John for collaborating on the anthology. I do know how much work it is to put those collections together. And I'm really looking forward to seeing it. So I was inspired by um, the reading for John Campbell yesterday, and, and I was thinking about another Fisher poet who passed a few years back, my dear friend Sue Sutherland Hansen. And so I thought I would read a few of her poems um, right now. So for those of you who didn't know her, Sue grew up in Port Townsend in a fishing family. Her father was Phil Sutherland, who was very active in fish politics in the 70s. He was the head of the Puget Sound Gill Netters Association and he drowned tragically off the off um, point no point while gill netting for salmon one fall November night in back in 1981. Um, and the first poem I'm gonna read is, is Sue re remembering her father from the point of view of, of a young child. It's called Waiting. W-A-D-I-N-G. A foghorn, distant and familiar, transports me to a girl who stands above a fish hold, looks down at her father, standing in the belly of his boat, surrounded by salmon shining silver round his boots. He bends and hoists his catch, gill by gill, to the buyer's bin. That baritone horn, that baritone horn carries me on tides of time back 50 years to tidal pools near a girl waiting, watching bullheads, tiny crab, arcs of water from clams in the sand. She stands to the sound of a boat mixing its diesel chug with the buoy's bell, the sound thinned by sea and time. She waves to the boat knowing she is unseen, watches the silhouette of her father's gill netter as known to her as the profile of his face now set north to the salmon banks. Though I come back to my older self, I travel on the curves of a foghorn's wave, base and big, floating on sand flats shaped by the water that left them in the tides following that siren call of the moon, which pulls to distant shores where it is morning and there are salmon and a girl wades then stands catching sight of someone she loves. That's such a beautiful tribute to her father and Sue has many more beautiful poems about her father. Um, fittingly, Sue and I met on the Edmonds Kingston Ferry Run on the water while we were commuting to work at, we both taught at Edmonds Community College for several decades together. And within 15 minutes of our first meeting, we discovered our shared heritage of fishing. And over the next two decades, we um, developed and shared our love of words too. I told Sue about Fisher Poets, of course, and soon she and her sister Vicki began attending and performing too. And I think they were attending for close to a decade and, and Vicki still comes now. Um, and so here's another poem by Sue that's about both fishing and writing. It has a wonderful metaphor. It's called, As I Bend Over My Pen, Fishing for Something Glistening. More often than not, I follow a gull soaring across my mind with its irresistible arch. Then I miss the subtle tug from the depths. It gets away. Sometimes I snag a dogfish with its back cracked by the last fisherman who caught it, or a ball of tangled kelp becomes the slippery catch of the day. Fishermen and poets will tell you that what we do is a lot about being present to possibility and surprise. 
I pull line from the reel, yarding more and more until a long line of words bends with the current before becoming that plumb line, stretching down straight to the dark below. I stare into water with layers of translucence melting into black. I stare, imagining what swims below. I feel the cutting skin of the shark tumble round in the displaced water, swirling after a whale's fluke. Marvel at the grace of the jellyfish and the wily wisdom of octopi. After a while, poetry feels like breathing underwater, a lifeline holding me to the air of my mystery. So in memorial to Sue Sutherland Hansen, who left us too soon in um, 2019, and um, may her words and spirit live on in our hearts. Well, Holly, thanks for bringing Sue to the gathering, bringing her here, we, reminding us of uh, how much we miss her. Uh, lovely that her words remain back. We'll hear more of them in the future, at future Campbell's last sets, I, I know. Thanks so much. That was generous of you. Well, Rich Bard's coming to us from Vashon Island, and I'm going to ask Pat Dixon there, Olympia, to be uh, on deck. Good to see you, Rich. Thank you, John. I'm going to read a, a fable out of a book of fables I finished recently. And this one's called The Music Critics of Sitka Sound. I came out of Sitka on a new trip. I had topped off with fuel and ice and groceries, but they'd been out of stock on Wanderlust. Cape Edgecombe was close by at the mouth of Sitka Sound, it was a reliable place to find fish. So I went out there, even though it always meant jostling for right away in a thick fleet. It was like being a street vendor on the crowded sidewalk in Times Square in New York. You'd lay out your goods and hope someone would come along and bite. The appearance of quality was important. If your supplier gave you some knockoff Gucci handbags with the brand spelled G-O-O-C-H-Y, you might not catch much. About the same as if you trolled spoons of a color that salmon find repellent, like blackberry wine blue. When I got through to the Cape, I pushed through the Times Square crowd and set up my little table with the shiny watches and fashion accessories. The watches were moving okay, the handbags not too bad, but as usual, the crowd was oppressive. And later in the day, when you had to worry about drunks stumbling into your table, I pulled out of there and trolled off into the deep water of the Sitka Sound's mouth. After a while, when we'd left the fleet well astern, only their mast tops showing as thin specks on the horizon, the fishing picked up. It stayed really busy all afternoon. We were working hard pulling fish and cleaning and icing, and then right around sunset, it all shut off. There was no wind out there. The ocean was smooth and glassy with just a low swell. With the sun turning the clouds to the west, all shades of red and orange, it seemed like a nice place to spend the night. So I shut the engine down to drift. There'd been a lot of dolphins around while we were fishing, which was not unusual, but now they were all around the boat, maybe a couple hundred of them, lazing around like it had been a long busy day for them too. They were Pacific white-sided dolphins, nice looking animals. Maybe they'd like some entertainment, I thought. So while my deckhand Jim was fixing dinner, I took a soprano recorder I kept on board and sat out on the hatch cover and considered what to play. The dolphins were putting out a low key vibe, like they'd showed up early at the club, lounging at the tables and smoking and jiving and waiting for things to start to cook. Something edgy, maybe, with a nervous energy would be about right, I thought. So I tried a high squeaky riff that ran around, chasing its tail and jumping up in the air and snapping its teeth. I didn't play too long. Before I was very far into it, the whole audience submerged and swam off three or four boat lengths to the north before surfacing again and grumbling. I got the gist of what they were saying. 
What's up with that? Playing distress calls with that terrible accent. Too weird. Not just weird. Grating. Dudes know John Coltrane. Not even a Kenny G. Hey, I like Kenny G. Smooth as silk, him. But, right, this guy doesn't have the chops of either of them. This was true enough, but I wasn't all that bad. Maybe they'd prefer classical. I sucked some spit out of the mouthpiece, tried again. Jesu, joy of man's desiring. That kicked it. I'd only floated out a bar or two of the beautiful melody before they again came back close. And I kept playing until it finished. And when I stopped, it was really quiet. And then, I swear this is no lie, one white-sided dolphin stood on its head with its tail out of the water and smacked the surface a whole bunch of times. So, Bach. This book calls itself a fable because it's, uh, it leans towards animism, and a lot of the characters, even besides the humans, have personalities. The fish, the birds, the sea lions, even a river or two have opinions, and they're not shy about expressing them. So it's a book of fables, and it's called Sayu Blue. It's published. You could find it if you looked up the title. Sayu is a river in the top of the Gulf of Alaska. It plays a part. Thanks a lot for having us. It's been great. Well, that's a nice story there. Rich, thanks for listening so carefully to those, uh, those animals that we uh, a lot of folks don't get to spend time with as intimately as you guys do. So, great. Thanks for coming. And thanks, Pat, for showing up again today. Oh, thanks my for, pleasure. For Looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks. Uh, the um, Rich, that was that was a great story. I, I love dolphins and um yeah I'll, I'll look up that book so this is uh this is a piece i picked because it's uh first rainy day in a while and and uh this is one that i that i wrote uh about rain this is also in my book the waiting to deliver um and uh um yeah and so that's what this is this is called rain dream it's fall so it's easy to find myself in a coffee shop writing about rain. Coffee seems to go best with rain. I wrap my fingers around the cup more to connect with what a rainy day feels like than for warmth. I watch the downpour dance on the sidewalk and street outside the window. The glass streaks with rivulets of water running to the ground and the scene before me dissolves into streaks of a chilly Alaskan rain running down the dusty windshield of a dry docked boat in the spring. The sound of drops is drowned out by the thumpa 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 of the ro rotating diesel stovepipe cap and the low moan of wind in the rigging. A gust throws spatters on the window and I'm standing in my oilskins on the flying bridge looking out over the bow. Raindrops sting my face as the bo boat slices through the waves. The rhythmic diesel roars in my ears, and I notice soundless circles dancing on the side of a glassy swell, expanding, then disappearing into ripples of newer drops. Light upon dark upon light, it's a silent ballet in a world filled with more urgent noises. The swell rolls away, and I awaken on another morning to a muted patter on the roof of the boat, barely audible the rain utters a gentle whisper that I just might understand if only I listened hard enough. I walk outside into a soft downpour that speaks in voices I have never before encountered. In the pre-dawn light, I watch the water dance in tiny liquid explosions of gravity on a gray mirror of ocean. The boats of the fleet, dull and oblivious, sway heavily on their anchors. In the near distance, dark gray forms against lighter grays of water and cloud, all connected, shrouded, washed in rain. The sound of hissing is faint. At first, I don't hear it under the drumming of the drops on the deck, pinging on the metal mast, plopping off the rigging 
off the gunwales into the sea. All that is more conscious, more evident. Underneath it all is a hiss, a lighter, softer, white noise. It's as if the sea and the sky are conversing in an altogether foreign language, a language so primal as to be all but inaudible to my modern ear, filled as it is with noises and sounds I not only help create, but inspire. Buddha speaks of the seeking of silence, an inner peace that is heart and soul of existence. For a few moments, standing on deck, for a few heartbeats on a silent boat floating on a quiet sea, I eavesdrop upon another dimension. I sway heavily on an anchor of my own, hooked deep, listening to voices surrounding me like an ocean. The rain eases and the clouds lift. As the sky brightens, I slowly become aware of rain-soaked socks chilling my feet. I blink away my reverie to notice fat drops of water dripping from the brim of my hat. A shiver raises the hair on the back of my neck, and with it, I turn and open the cabin door. It's time to brew the morning's warm coffee with water that's fallen from the sky. I listen to the waning drops patter upon the roof as they mingle with the sound of coffee dripping into my cup. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks, Lila. Oh, that's lovely, Pat. Oh, yeah, the sounds and paying attention to nature around us, isn't that part of the pleasure that we enjoy fishing commercially? Thanks for bringing that to us. Well, Tala is going to join us now from Bo, Washington up there. She's another uh, finesse fisherman, a troller out there on the West Coast. So, Tala, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks, John. And thanks, Lila and the gallery. You know, when we, um, when we are able to be together in Astoria, um, it is always really hard for me and my partner, Joel, to uh, leave at the weekend. And so we are always very grateful for the time in your gallery um, to still hang on to being together for one more day and every minute we can. Um, so I'm a salmon troller out of Sitka, Alaska, um, out of the same waters that Rich referenced. And um, what that means is hook and line, uh, beautifully inefficient, one fish at a time that we clean them all on the boat. And um, it is just Joel and I on the Nurka and very laborious, um, but out of love. And so the, the poem that I have is, I am not a poet, but John challenges us to write poems even when we are essayists or prose writers. So this is uh, my acquiescence that and it's called Salmon Row and it is in the anthology. Uh, faced with a toad of coho to clean, I bypass hooked snout boys in favor of ripe bellied ladies. September's spawners make easy pickings. Swollen flesh slips from my blade. I reach in extract a sunrise of interrupted possibilities. Hoisting the skein in gloved hand, I think each individual egg is like the stories we tell. What came to pass, what didn't, what was, what might have been. All fragile beads of truth, one connected to another. Memory within membrane, extended in offering to you. Cocking my arm, I wind up, pitch these untold stories to an audience of albatross. One surges forward, gobbles them whole, and cries for more. Thanks for having us, Lila, and the work on the anthology and uh, Hope to see you all next year. Uh, thank you, Tella. The irony of that lovely poem is is uh, is really precious, isn't it? That's that's good. I love your essays and I love your poems. Thanks for 
branching out for us too. So uh, Jeff Stonehill's up in Seattle. He's going to go next. And uh, I think Hope's going to follow him. Thanks, Hope, for uh, getting in line there. Ready, Jeff? Yeah. Yeah, thanks, John. When you fish, you you kill other beings. Uh, it's a little thing to get used to. It used to freak me out a bit. Uh, but I got to the place where I rationalized. I said, fish and game tells me when to go to harvest the extra. Follow the rules, keep the run healthy, and it's all good. Don't cheat. Don't let the greed win. This one's called Death Larson's Son. I had the perfect opener set. Low water at the marker sticks. The cork line lit up real nice. Bobber splashers and tail kicks. When a ghost gray skiff slipped out of the mist and set out right above me, fishing barely opened. And he's down to his plimsoll line, and now he's laced me cork for cork. Who is this dirty swine? Bastard must have fished last night, maybe half the closure. I'm a pretty mellow guy, but I lost my composure. I didn't have to raise my voice. His boat was just that close. But I couldn't really see his face beneath the Helly Hansen hood. Who the hell you think you are? You're over the line and you cork me good. A baleful look from a skeletal face. Who I am you will not wish to know. My blood grew cold, but I kept my bold. Look, just pick up and go. No, I think I'll fish a while. And since we're neighbors, let's be friends. You ask me who I thought I was. Well, I guess that depends. A couple of centuries back, I ran an Nantucket whale ship in the Baja and Pacific, two years or more each trip. Flens them out and boil the oil, the Portuguese and Maori's toil. Quiet nights in Ahab's cabin I heard the whales sing of their families lost, their elders gone, but it didn't mean a thing. And when the nail, the whales were near killed off, I took the seals and the pribiloffs, filled my hold with seal skins, wiped out all their kith and kin. In those days, I was <laughs> Death Larson's son. But now the sealing days are done. I'm the bastard spawn of Poseidon. Blackbeard's blood runs in my veins. And when all your fish are gone, I'll be the one to blame. Every fish in every ocean, I'd say they're all mine. I'm the tragedy of the commons, the death of the fishery. Don't ask to whom these fish belong. They all belong to me. Behind the markers, on the closures, I take them wherever I may. The fish bug tries to pinch me, but I always slip away. I don't just kill them for the money. I eat one now and then, grilled, broiled, braised, or smoked. But to me, they all taste better poached. And when you're crabbing or long lining on a gloomy, foggy day, running your string, you may see a boat working the other way, pulling your pots, stealing your butts, not bothering to rebate, ripping you off behind your back and scuttling off in a plume of black. But these are diverting child's play, you know, I have far better ways than a fish trap or a can line <laughs> to make a fish run go away. Damn a stream to grow potatoes. Kill a crick to mine for gold. Pour your toxins in the river. She'll carry your crimes down to the sea and the ocean takes in 
all our sins so much greater than you or me. So you don't need to ask my name. Just look into your soul at the dark thing lurking, the old fish killing ghoul. Then he shrugged, started picking. He picked his fish real quick. And all those fish that should have been mine. But that thought sort of made me sick when he had his gear aboard and flipped his buoy end. He idled slowly down my net, back to my boat end. These fish belong to no one. No one owns the ocean, so no crime has been committed. Swallow that emotion. Breathe my name, and it's my curse. All things live for me. And if I cannot catch them all, I'll fish for all eternity. Thanks a lot for the chance to do this. Appreciate it. I hope my light was on there. I see it looked uh, a little off and on. Thanks a lot, John, and everybody for making this happen. Uh, thanks for writing that one, Jeff. Jack London, be proud and uh, a little sorry, too. So that's a good good one. Greed Larson. So Hope's up next. Hope comes to us from local boy right here at the mouth of the Columbia River. And uh, following him, uh, uh, John Van Amberg is going to give us a couple songs from from uh, Vashon Island there. I hear Hobie. Come on in, Hope. Well, good evening, John. And I echo all the thanks to uh, the organizers and to Lila. And I'm looking forward to seeing the book been thinking today because this morning Gina and I had a conversation over Skype with our daughter in Norway who is more than mildly freaked out by the uh, the invasion of the Ukraine and the Russian war of aggression and you know it got me to thinking that well that makes what I've been doing this weekend seem pretty trivial and then I thought no wait a minute it's the other way around because in times like this it's the art and music and poetry and community that we share that are really important and that's a lot more important than aggressive action and what is sadly going on in the world at this point so i'm going to bring you a short one uh, it was intended as a uh, companion piece to the song that I sang last night. And uh, for those names I see on the screen here, I don't need to provide this definition, but for anybody else who might be viewing, a red, spelled R-E-D-D, -D, is the nest that the female Salmonid digs with her tail in the act of spawning. So this is called For Shoals of Salmon Lay Their Reds. are gone, the river flows, and time moves on, the silt has settled on what once was, and memory fades as everything does, the cannery closed, and jobs were lost, is it still progress? Despite the cause, where once were salmon, our power dams, and you can't pack memories into cans. Sing me a river, 
wild and free, with freshets surging towards the sea, with rapids forming spawning beds, where shoals of salmon can lay their red. Their names are numbered down on the wall Beneath the bridge where memory calls The days we'll never see again When our town centered round the lives of fishermen Sing me a river wild and free with freshets surging towards the sea, with rapids forming spawning beds, where shoals of salmon can lay their rest, where shoals of salmon can lay their rest. That's it. Thanks. Uh, thanks for taking us, taking us there. I hope those days uh, continue and return. So also, thanks for that lovely banjo playing. That's my favorite banjo. That's my favorite banjo. Well, Van Am's next, I believe, going to bring us some music from Vashon Island. Van Am is one of the uh, reasons we have a Fisher Poets Gathering. I want you guys at Canon Beach Arts Association and your friends to know that because he was a pioneer in uh, publishing uh, Fisher poetry in the industry magazine out here, the Alaska Fisherman's Journal, uh, 30 years ago or so. So it's uh, it's good to have you, Van Am. Give us a, another one of your lovely songs. Uh, Johnny, thank you. Uh, proud to be here. Uh, yeah. 20 years ago, I was editor of the Alaska Fisherman's Journal. And uh, first I might say, uh, uh, John Campbell did one of my songs for me last night, The Kid on the Corps of May. It's in the anthology and he did a great job. So I'm gonna leave that and move on up to Dutch Harbor and take a look backward to when I was editor of AFJ and and it was uh, 2001, and the flatfish catcher processor Arctic Rose sank in the Bering Sea. Um, every man aboard, all 15 of them, lost their lives and went to the bottom. The Coast Guard held a hearing into the disaster, and I attended it every day because that was part of my job. And, um, Turns out that the boat was totally unprepared and ill-equipped for its task in the Bering Sea, as evidenced by the fact that every time it came into port, half the crew left the boat because it didn't have the capacity or the equipment to process enough flatfish to make any money if you were a processor who got paid by the case. So why were they out there? Um, the boat was top-heavy. They'd modified it so that it was grossly out of compliance with its stability book. Um, yet they went out there, and the crews kept changing. But there were always greenhorns who were ready to take a job for a chance to make a living. And uh, some of them got a hell of a lot more than they signed on for. So I wrote this song about it after watching the hearings and feeling really bad about the whole thing. I know some people in Montana who knew some kids on that boat. And there was a bunch of folks from Mexico who got a chance to fish on it. And they signed a board with 
false names because they didn't have documentation. And so when they listed the people who died on the boat, they didn't even have the right names for the guys from Mexico. It's pathetic. They came from Montana, they came from Mexico Headed north to Alaska, they were dying to go Some hardly spoke English, but a chance to be free Lay waiting in Dutch Harbor on the Bering Sea She was waiting in Dutch Harbor on the Bering Sea Ninety-two feet from her stern to her nose She had a name like a beauty, the Arctic Rose Built down in Mississippi where the shrimp ran pink They converted her to flatfish, she was safe you'd think She had a Coast Guard sticker, she was safe you'd think But they started hearing stories When they got on the ship She'd been losing half her crew After each and every trip Ninety-two feet From the stern to her nose But you couldn't make a living On the Arctic Rose It wasn't worth a ticket On the Arctic Rose But they worked on the slime line 16 hours a day They rode home to their sweethearts So very far away Their backs grew weary Their fingers froze But you couldn't make a living on the Arctic Rose Cause they paid you by the case On the Arctic Rose It was cramped in the process room and crowded on the line They headed and they gutted, they lost track of time The hydraulics screamed and the music played loud And the door at the back was the only way out But if you tied the door open you could maybe see out Well, nobody knows how it happened that night They'd been hidden on the flatheads, everything was going right But they busted their asses, packing them down And they hit the bunks hard and fell asleep sound They hit the bunks hard and fell asleep sound Alone in the Bering Sea with no one around She vanished in the night She capsized, they said The Amigos and Montana boys Everyone was dead She flooded through the open door Someone forgot to latch it poured into the process room and down through the hatch They were finally on the fish, they were finally doing fine But they were headed to the bottom in two minutes time One body and an empty raft was all they did find Well the Coast Guard held their hearing, they wrapped up the case they softballed the owner, everybody saved face They blamed it on the doorman and called the case closed But there's just one question about the Arctic Rose 
One nobody ever answered about the Arctic Rose She was out of her league on the flatfish grounds Hell, you couldn't make a living haul in 5,000 pounds Just how she could make it, well, nobody knows So why were they fishing the Arctic Rose? You couldn't make a nickel on the Arctic Rose So why were they fishing the Arctic Rose? She had a name like a beauty, the Arctic Rose. Be careful. I love you. Well, that's a heartbreaker. Again, every time is a heartbreaker. And 20 years later, it's a heartbreaker, John. And heartbreaking times in a lot of places. So thanks for, thanks for bringing that to us. We'll sing it again in our own cabins, in our own boats. Measy is, uh, we're going up to Alaska now. We got a lot of friends standing by up there. And Measy, uh, the set net vet is going to join us for a while. We're glad to hear you here today, Measy. Thanks for coming in. Come in, Measy. We'll stand by. Is it on? There you are. Okay. Is my video on? Okay. Yep. It's winter in the Great Land, and the days are dwarfed by nights. The skies are lit by dancing, crackling northern lights. The river ice is snapping like beasts busting through the timber. The cold cuts through my joints. They are much more stiff than limber. The fluttering aurora catches stars in a mesh of green. My thoughts start to wander as I survey the scene. The longer days of summer now compose my dreams with visions of the sockeyes return to natal streams. Nets flung across the water like these lights across this sky. Salmon hung like stars, flashing silver sides. The days are getting longer and soon I will be out there on the inlet, rocking on the seas. But it's still winter in the great land and the days are dwarfed by nights, though the skies are lit by dancing, crackling northern lights. That one's called Winter Dreams. That's in, in the book. Um, this next one I'm going to do is uh, sadly a true story from the summer set in rhyme. I call this, You're Not You When You're Hungry. It was an early morning set out. The day seemed far from foul. Then I met Mama Bruin. She was out there on the prowl. My mind was on salmon. While on the drive, I'd interrupted her breakfast at 3.45. She was at the neighbor's hen house looking for eggs and bacon. Serious about Brecky from her slumber shaken. Faster than lightning, she had tacked my Tacoma truck. Didn't even have time to say, well, son of a buck. I slammed it in reverse, almost drove off of my hill. About that time, this mama bear took apart my grill. She bit up the bumper, tap danced on my hood. Fortunately, the driver's seat is still clean and good. She kept on a coming. I thought, is this how it ends? Taking four, I'm old enough to need them dang depends. When suddenly it was done, she left me without speech. I collected myself, quietly headed for the beach. I set the nets, then posted pics. That's when life took a spiral. Someone said, make it public and the blasted thing went viral. You know life's gone awry when you call Jake to make your claim and he already knows you from your Facebook fame. I contemplate what to do after this nightmare day. Think I'll drain the wiper fluid, replace it with bear spray. 
Looking back, I made mistakes. My mind wasn't working quick. I didn't even think to take that badass selfie pic. But hindsight's 2020. Isn't that the kicker? I should have rolled down my window and handed her a Snickers. I'm going to leave you with this one. Um, this is how set knitters describe a bad day. I call this leads over. Have you ever had a really rough day? One of those tide ripping, sou'wester blowing leads over corks kind of days where you can't decide which side of the net to approach on the ebb because the wind against the tide has you all jacked up with your stern blown sideways. And if you aren't careful, you're gonna get web in the wheel. One of those kind of days. We've all been there. And all you can do is keep fishing, keep picking and keep pulling. Eventually the tide will ease up, the wind will lay down and the swells will abate and you will find yourself rocking on a gentler sea. My friends, not every net will be full, but not every one will be a water haul either. We all have leads over kind of days, but there are good hauls awaiting. So fight through and hold on. And please remember you're not alone because I will be holding on too. Thank you guys. Thank you to everyone who put this on. Thanks. Thanks, Meezy, for bringing those to us. Uh, nice variety. Thanks for the leads over cork days, leads over days. Yeah. The set netters understand that one. I think anybody drifts or uses the nets there that will. Well, remember, it's nice to know we're not alone. Hold fast. Meezy came to us from the Kenai Peninsula up there on uh, the banks of uh, Cook Inlet and a couple other guys were up there. Uh, Clark Whitney and Steve Schoonmaker are going to take turns at, I think, they're at Clark's place. Thanks for joining us today, you guys. Yeah, thanks. Uh, well, uh, I got a poem here that I wrote for this book. Um, John told me about it and, and it was like 80 lines or less. I thought, mm, I got one like that. So I wrote this one. Uh, <laughs> on Friday night when we had the, the fishing ports thing, uh, in the dash to get tied up again, I forgot to dedicate the poem that I had to John Campbell. Uh, so this one's dedicated to John. Um, the poem's called Gray. It's a blending that way on a canvas of gray from the palette of colors in the creation of day contributions of light to the mysteries of gray. A composition designed for a canvas undefined, left up to the sky in its palette's response from the sea, wheeling the colors continuously in the purified rinse of the watershed streams, rinse through the blue and the brown and the green, gravitationally painting with the soil and the trees, which are growing in the mists of the glacier's retreat, which are grinding up mountains for the gray of the sea. It composes with me. On a canvas undefined, it composes with tide, all of it water and all of it sky. Sunbeams to the moon, which reflects to the night, and the temporal colors that change with the light. The color wheel spins in a rainbow of nights, and its arc through the spray on a palette of gray into the thousands of words that a painting can say. I'd lay my whole gill net while the paint is still wet. As wild salmon enter the edge of the frame and then enter the web of my net. Silver sides, blue backed, white bellies beneath. I paint brush my instincts in the incoming breeze, reacting the surface to a bright shimmering. The painter myself, but not really me, but an artistic eye. It's a canvas, it's a composition designed for canvas undefined, so left up to the sky. And its palette's response from the sea wheeling the colors continuously. And if, if as should be, as related to composition, and I'm able to see, my paintbrush turns around and starts painting in me. It's a blending that way on a canvas of gray, this often wet painting that's never the same. 
way beyond borders of conceptual frames, down cork lines, two bright buoys contrasting the bay. On a canvas of gray, the patterns repeat what the red flesh fillets of the salmon I eat. On the stove at the source of the boat cabin's heat, my paintbrush turns around, yeah, and starts painting in me. And so gratefully, you see, it's a blame that way. On a canvas of gray, this, this painting that's never complete. It just can't dry. And, and having said that, you know, uh, I was able to hear some of the tribute to John. And when I heard Larry Captain playing one of John's songs, I thought the same thing. It's, it's a painting that's never complete. It's a blending that way. You know, John's not gone. It's all blended from us sharing these things, you know. Uh, so that's pretty much what I have to say. And uh, thanks for inviting me to be a part of it and, uh, and to, for a chance to be in the book. So uh, thanks. Here comes Clark. Uh, or is Clark next? I think Clark is. I am next. Um, I'm really honored to be included in this with all of these people that um, the Fisher poets that I have so much respect for. Uh, when I was one of the times I performed in Astoria, I was lucky enough to be able to go to Cannon Beach, and I just felt it was a real honor to be included in that. So um, the, I have a short thing I want to share today. Um, I started fishing in Bristol Bay on a on a drift gillnader in 79, and my father bought the boat and the permit, and he came from the East Coast, and um, he was born and raised in Maine, and the people back there uh, have a lot of superstitions that um, go along with fishing and being on the water, and we had a um, we had a, a sort of a superstition. It was we felt that it was good luck to um, eat the first salmon that came over the roller um, every season, and so this is a a little um, poem story that I wrote about that. It's called the first salmon of the season. The first salmon of the season comes over the roller and is picked carefully, bled and buried in the ice, later filleted butterfly style, then split carefully down the middle. No belly meat is lost. Cooked hot, flesh side down first to seal in the juices, then skin to the heat until perfectly done. Flaky, seasoned with a little salt. First bite is chewed slowly, mindfully. Smell of the ocean in the back of the throat. When the breath is exhaled through the nose, a warm flush suffuses the body when salmon oil hits an empty stomach. Crustaceans consumed in the deep Pacific give the sockeye flesh its color. This fish traveled from a mountain lake to there and back. What a journey. Incredible strength of nature shared by the salmon life giver renewed and returned essence of life, of hope for the future, of love and rebirth, living symbol of love in a vibrant, silvery, sinuous shape. The Denina people of Upper Cook Inlet understood the sacrifice made by the salmon and told of it in the story of the one who swam back inside with them. In the beginning, the people have no salmon. A boy turns into a fish. Then the salmon come to them for the first time. So the boy swims back out to the ocean with the salmon. We eat the first salmon of the year with mindfulness and gratitude. It becomes part of us. We become part of everything. We swim back out to the ocean with the first salmon. And that's um, part of what I wanna say is my gratitude to the salmon um, and so thank you for letting me read that today. That's your name. That's your name. This is Clark Whitney. That was Clark Whitney. Steve Schoonmaker. Thanks, Clark, for bringing that to the reverence that uh, fishermen and women, of course, have uh, for salmon is really remarkable, isn't it? You know, Steve, I remember uh, Dave Densmore just. Uh, just the scariest looking fisherman you ever met, but he won't let his won't let his deckhand throw a fish or kick a fish. It's just they they can't do it. He's got a poem for the love of fish, you know. 
I think it does help us that they're all off to spawn and going to their deaths already. So we feel a little, we feel a little easier about that. Thanks for bringing that. And Steve, uh, your poetry uh, just makes me see, see uh, even a gray day in the Nushigak, you know, with a few buoy balls out there and maybe a little sunlight on the horizon. It makes me see that again and appreciate even that gray. So thanks for, thanks for joining us. Good. We'll look for, forward to hearing some more. Well, Megan, uh, Gervais is waiting for us up there at Homer. And uh, thanks, Megan, for making an effort to join us here. We would have missed you this weekend if we didn't get you to join us someplace. So thanks for thanks for coming tonight. Hey, thanks for um, encouraging me to participate. John, you're always keeping me in the loop. Otherwise, I might just float off to sea. Um, that poem of Clark's, that was pretty great. We do the same thing every year and it made me hungry for fresh salmon. Um, it's break up here in February in Homer. Uh, the, the roads are running with mud and all the snow is melted off my boat. We were just up at Olsa Mountain today and that road is just nothing but mud. It reminded me of the color of the Nushigak. You know salmon season's coming because stand alongside the, seat, the ski trail and all the fishermen are starting to talk about salmon season more than they're talking about skiing. So we've kind of kind of made that shift already. It feels a little early, but um, definitely feeling that momentum. The fish are out there. They're starting to turn around and point their noses back in this direction. Maybe they're not swimming back this way yet, but they're thinking about it. All right, so I, I'll read the poem that I submitted to the book. Um, it's kind of, it's a recycled one. I edited it to fit. Um, it's called Little Fish. We drug the net over a snag off airport beach and made a bus size hole in the net. We can fix it, stretch it over the back deck, corks hooked over the port cleat, Lead line looped over the fair lead. Match the ragged edges, trim the flap, lace it up. Won't be perfect, just good enough. It'll fish. Often the fix is easy, <clears throat> just a loose electrical connection or fuel. Change the raycore and the engine roars back to life. For the leaky hydraulic hose, we have a spare. Look under the port side bunk. For the toughest bolt to break free, try two drops of penetrating oil and a cheater bar on the biggest wrench, mallet coercion and put the heat to it. Work smarter, not harder. Add a few choice words and some blood for your, from your knuckles. For non-moving parts, don't underestimate the value of marine adhesive, well chosen and carefully applied to make it as good as new. No, it's better than new, it's custom and it'll fish. It is perhaps 10 times more work to fix anything on anchor than in the yard and 50 times harder to fix it when it's blowing west 25 and the bilge ate your 3 8 wrench and you're days away from parts and you haven't slept more than two in 24 for who knows how long. But some repairs cannot be anticipated. The components concealed within their dark steel housings and even if we ply them with the proper lubricant at regular intervals, they occasionally give up at inconvenient moments, like the shorn spline shaft on the hydraulic pump that quit mid-set during the peak of the run while we were drifting toward the breakers with a heavy net. That was an expensive one, not just in parts, but missed fishing. Some fixes require eight hours on the phone, troubleshooting and ordering parts while standing in the rigging in sideways rain and the cell phone signal keeps dropping. And sorry, Dick, and scan the tender lines to see what we aren't delivering. The next plane is when? Some things are beyond repair. Electronics eaten by salt water, that black pipe fitting on the bronze washdown pump that just crumbled in my hand. That did teach a lesson about galvanic corrosion and dissimilar metals, Combination, combinations destined for dysfunction. Won't repeat that mistake. <clears throat> I am held together by splash zone, zip ties, black tape, hose clamps, 
the spare scrap of busted buoy and hanging twine hitched back upon itself over and over for strength. And a bit of 4,200 for good measure. Not the prettiest fix, but functional. Every repair tells the story of itself. A knot correctly tied can fix many things and can for a time even hold together the broken parts of broken hearts. The better fix takes a little more doing. Untie the lines and point the boat to sea, apply wind, sky, salt, and northern latitudes. Withhold sleep and top off the hydraulic oil and diesel tanks, then bring on the salmon. Won't ever be like new, but it'll fish. That's all I have today. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Megan, for joining us. Yeah, I repeat that to myself all the time out there. It'll fish. I think. Thanks for reminding us. It's nice, again, not to be alone when you're in a, in a pickle like that. No, you got plenty of company. Thanks for writing that for us. Well, Mary Garvey, the voice of the Lower Columbia and so many other places, thanks for joining us to finish, I think, here uh, tonight uh, with a song or two for us. We're glad you came, Mary. Thank you. You'll need to unmute yourself there, though. You'd think I'd get used to that. Okay, this is a song about the herring, um, how they were appreciated by the native people up in uh, Sitka, Alaska, and the rituals they had. And they were after the row. So this is about how they collect the row. And the tune is an old Irish tune. In the land of the bear and the great Sitka spruce, herring were given to us for our use. Each year when the herring converge on our banks, we gather in gratitude, dance and give thanks. Herring are living our hands to employ, herring our heritage, herring our joy. In spring to the edge of the water we go and wait for the fish to deposit their row. Branches of hemlock will lay on their sides for the herring to spawn on the incoming tides. Herring are living our hands to employ, herring our heritage, herring our joy. Our brothers and sisters across the great seas hope to have herring as plenty as these. Their nets will be filled and their bellies as well. Herring to eat and herring to sell. Herring are living our hands to employ. Herring our heritage, herring our joy. For thousands of years, your people and mine made sure that the herring would never decline. We pray the Great Spirit will prosper the run. The herring will last until their stay is done. Herring are living our hands to employ. Herring our heritage, herring our joy. Herring are living our hands to employ. Herring our heritage, herring our joy. And it's really interesting where they talk about the other people across the seas. I thought they meant, you know, Norwegians and Irish, but they had great connections to Japan and, and similar um, rituals, maybe very ancient. I don't know. But anyway, it's all it's all universal. Great. We're, we're not sure if you might have one more for us there, Mary. Ah. You gave us one. We got we got a moment or two and uh, moment or two. Lovely. Sure. Well, so I sing Astoria's bar. That would be appropriate, appropriate and lovely, and we could probably all sing along with you yeah. at home. That'd be great. Thank you. And you know, I can't do it. Other people made it into a chorus, and I just can't do that. Um, my brain doesn't work well enough, so I'll just do it the regular old way. Um, 
It's not very far to Astoria's bar, but a very long journey it can be. You can start at the mouth of the mighty Blue River and end at the bottom of the sea. When the tide is rough, so very, very rough, so rough that you cannot stand, it drives the little fish right into the nets, the boats right into the sand. In the mist and the rain, the labor and the pain, you know what the fishing air is worth. It is worth all the gold as they suck them from the hold, worth all the treasures of the earth. And the river still shines and shimmers in the light as it did in a grandfather's day, when they rode all night and fished in the morning and lived in Willapaw Bay. And the river still shines and shimmers in the light as it did in our grandfather's day when they rode all night and fished in the morning and lived in Willapaw Bay. Oh, thank you so much for everything. All right, well, I, we, uh, you know, uh, I hate to prevail upon you, but sometimes they'll stand on and give people uh, ovations and uh, get them out for one more and uh you can say no but if you had the cannery shed there uh handy we promise we wouldn't ask anything further of you okay uh, we'll see if we can do it yeah thank you my computer lost all my songs it died um cannery shed um it, uh, how's it start um the cannery shed <laughs> which is over the river well i'll probably start in the middle of it the cannery shed perches over the river when the winter winds blow, you freeze in the shiver. When the boss comes around, you might have to give her my opinion of the cannery shed. We chop off the heads, chop off the tails, scoop out the guts and throw them in the pails. Won't get a rest till the next schooner sails from the dock at the cannery shed. The, you might, da, da, and you might lose a finger and you better move sharp or you might lose a finger. It'll make your stomach turn if you knew everything has been canned in the cannery shed. La Fe, he went away and he wrote me a letter and I tucked it up high in the sleeve of my sweater. I would if I could, but I'm not. <laughs> I totally lost it. The cannery boy, he's a very happy fella if he gets him a girl from the little town of Stella. I would if I could, but I'm not gonna tell you what goes on behind the cannery shed. <laughs> oh boy. You better not give me an Alzheimer's test too soon. Unflappable, Mary. That's so terrific. Thanks for thank coming. You. Thanks for writing those, and 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 uh, thanks for joining us today. That was great fun. Yeah, it was. Well, I uh, I think that might be about all we got here, folks, for today. It's uh, time to head off and uh, go where we will. Thanks, you guys, for joining us from so far away, and. Uh, from nearby and uh, we look so forward to being together again Astoria and Cannon Beach and hope our paths cross before this time next year. Lila thanks for uh, initiating that uh, Fisher Poets anthology and uh, for inviting the uh, uh, Fisher Poets and uh, their friends to uh, celebrate the working waterfront in the gallery. And thank you, Jamie Boyd, for uh, helping us gather up the artwork as well. And uh, thanks for thanks for having us down. Thanks for your support for all these years of the Fisher Poets Gathering. And with that, I'm just going to sign off and stand by. Thank you.